Hey, good morning. Man, did y'all pick the best chapel of the year to come to? Woo! It's Missions Week. We are so excited about all the cool stuff we have going on. We had a great international worship service last night. Today, after chapel, we kick off the prayer tent that because of weather, we've had to move into the sack, but it's still a tent. We can still pray there. Um, so I hope you'll come, come to that with us. It's prayer going on all through the next, actually, 26 hours. Um, prayer for the nation. So I hope you'll come out to that. We also have missions fair from 1 to 3 today in the SAC, where you can learn more about the different missions opportunities that we'll be talking to you about today. But man, the whole point of this is not all the activities. The whole point is so that we can point other people to learn about God's love. And so we're going to worship him, we're going to praise him, and right now we're going we're gonna to pray to him, ask him to be with us during this service. Will you pray with me? God, we're so thankful for our salvation. We're thankful for what you have done for each of us. And God, I pray that you will make us instruments of your peace, instruments of your love as we go through today, through this week, and Lord, also through our lives. Lord, I pray that you will be with each person leading in worship today and pray that you will be um, a part of this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, chapel. Will you stand with us and worship?
For God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. La religión pura y sin mácula delante de Dios el Padre es esta, visitar a los huérfanos y a las viudas en sus tribulaciones y guardarse sin mancha del mundo. Hey, you can have a seat now. Our president, Dr. Carter, is going to come tell us about a special partnership that we're embarking on. But I couldn't let him get away. You might have noticed a few of us wearing these purple t-shirts to celebrate Missions Week. And I thought it was only appropriate that he have one, too. What do you think? Dr. Hernandez, thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Welcome to uh, Missions Week and Missions Chapel here today. We uh, are thrilled that Campbellsville University can provide this type of opportunity. You know, all of us have to make a decision. What do we do with our faith? Do we keep it to ourselves or do we share it with others? Do, is it important enough to us to actually get up and go jump online, contact, and communicate effectively, or do we just keep it to ourselves? And Missions Week is about sharing it, taking it to others, and making our faith real to others in the loving name of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, Twyla, Dr. Hernandez, thank you so much for your leadership through uh, School of Theology, uh, Dr. Hurchin, and all the faculty. Uh, and we certainly welcome our special guest, Dr. Wiggins, and thank you for uh, helping to have uh, uh, Mr. Kaiser here today. We, uh, we're, in August, we signed a new agreement. And uh, Campbellsville University doesn't just sign agreements with anyone. We want to make sure that who we cooperate with uh, has great integrity and that they do what they say they do. And especially when it comes to uh, philanthropic causes, causes that you know, you may wonder, you know, does my money actually go to where it's supposed to go? And one of the great mission organizations that is known around the world is Buckner International. Uh, they were formed in 1879, uh, have a great relationship with the General Convention of Texas. Uh, they work uh, with Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and they are known for their integrity. And so we signed an agreement that Campbellsville University and Buckner International would be working together for joint mission causes. And so uh, we are so excited to uh, have this relationship. Dr. Albert Reyes is their president. He's going to be uh, bringing a word to us here uh, by video, but uh, Dr. Reyes and I uh, agreed on a series of points and we think that it's going to make new and exciting opportunities for students, faculty and staff and coaches to be able to share the gospel. And so uh, I want to thank uh, several individuals that are going to be putting feet to action. I know Cho Sargent's going to be taking a group uh, here uh, as soon as school ends. Uh, I think Dr. Mudd is taking a group, uh, chair, dean of our School of uh, 
Carver School of Social Work. So again, we're just very excited about this new mission opportunity. Dr. Hernandez, anything else that, uh, I guess, we, let's, let's hear from Dr. Reyes. excited about the agreement that we've entered into, a memo of understanding that will provide opportunities for students to come and serve uh, throughout Texas and in Mexico. Now since 1879, Buckner has been serving vulnerable children, orphans and families, senior adults. Uh, Buckner came from uh, Kentucky and Tennessee to Texas and right before the Civil War he landed uh, in our state and then uh, saw the, the, the damage that uh, took place throughout the Civil War. Uh, dads would go off and fight, and uh, many didn't come back. So children became orphans, mothers became widows, and uh, R.C. Buckner uh, was a pastor, and he looked around in Texas, and he saw uh, the destruction of families and family units, and uh, said, we ought to do something as Christians, as followers of Jesus, uh, as members of, the, of, the church, of churches. So he gathered together people and uh, said, now, if it was you that died in the war, and your children and your wife is left behind, what would you want the Christian community to do? And with that clarion call, he raised funds uh, so that two years later, in 1879, he began the Buckner Children's Home in Dallas, Texas. Now, 140 years later, we're still serving vulnerable children. We're still helping orphans, serving orphans in other countries. We're still strengthening families so that children can stay in the family where God put them. And uh, we do it through foster care, do it through adoption in some cases. We have family strengthening programs, family pathways, family hope centers. And uh, these opportunities uh, are wide open for you as a student to take the skills and the learning that you're uh, now experiencing in your university experience and to put hands and feet to it so you can uh, put to application what you're learning and serve other people. So we're inviting you to consider uh, doing things like being a volunteer to come alongside our staff in Texas, on the border, in Mexico, and to serve uh, in communities like this where you can help strengthen a family or perhaps use your skills and your learning to do real practical things that families need to survive and be strengthened. So it could be a mission trip, it could be a week, it could be an internship for a semester, uh, and the idea is that you would come as a volunteer to give of your time to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, among families and children whose, uh, whose lives really uh, are, are find themselves needing hope, and you can make a difference uh, doing that. So I want to encourage you as we begin this five-year relationship to begin thinking about how you might spend a, a couple of weeks, a summer, a semester, and, uh, and put to practice your faith and what you're learning in your university experience. We're really excited uh, and uh, thank Dr. Carter for, for considering this opportunity. We know that we say that that hope shines here. And so we want you to come help us to shine hope throughout Texas, throughout Latin America, throughout Mexico, and uh, make a real difference in someone's life. So we look forward to everything. May God bless you, and uh, we look forward to working with you soon. So we are so excited about this new partnership with Buckner. Uh, Buckner International is a global ministry dedicated to the transformation and restoration of the most vulnerable around us. They seek to transform the lives of vulnerable children, enrich the lives of senior adults, and build strong families through Christ-centered values. So we thought it was a good match for who we are here at Campbellsville University, and I hope you'll all take a take a chance over these next few years to, to be involved. We're going to be serving specifically in Texas and Mexico. And so this first year, I'm gonna present our, our first three opportunities that we have to serve with Buckner. The first opportunity comes in the form of these shoe boxes here. We are gonna be taking up shoes, new tennis shoes for children, um, sizes one through five for boys and girls during the fall. And I'll be providing more information to the campus about that. Um, deadline is November 16th and we're going to be providing at least this is our goal at least 1,000 pairs of shoes for orphans 
in Texas and Mexico. That's one way you can be involved. The second way you can be involved is there will be a group from Campbellsville led by Cho Sargent going down to Dallas in December, right after the end of the semester, to take the shoes to the Buckner Distribution Center and help organize all the shoes that they're receiving in. From there, we have another group going out over spring break that will be going to Mexico City. And among the many things that we'll be doing on that trip is actually giving out some of the shoes to um, orphans and other vulnerable children there in Mexico City. So I invite you to, um, to learn more about this. We're gonna have a video now uh, specifically about the shoe project that's going on this um, semester. And then Lindsay Magruder will be coming to tell you about all of the opportunities that we have here at Campbellsville this year. There are more than 153 million orphans living in the world today. 1.2 billion live in extreme poverty, earning less than $1.25 a day. What if you could help just one of those children with one of life's most basic needs? Or what if you could help more? Buckner Shoes for Orphan Souls has been placing shoes on the feet of the world's orphans since 1999. Over 3 million children in more than 80 countries have received a new pair of shoes. Why shoes? Shoes are foundational to good health. They help children walk to school to receive an education, and they provide hope for tomorrow. Help. Many parasites and diseases enter the body through the feet. A good, sturdy pair of shoes can protect a child from basic illnesses to keep her safe. Education. Most schools around the world require children to wear shoes. New shoes can help a child access basic education and lead to every opportunity for success. Oh. For children who live in orphanages or in extreme poverty, a simple pair of shoes help them know they're loved and that they're not forgotten. When you give a pair of shoes for orphan souls, you're changing a child's life today and giving them hope for tomorrow. Join us. Let's change lives together. Buckner Shoes for Orphan Souls. Hope shines here. Good morning. My name is Lindsay Magruder and I am the missions coordinator for VCM. This year we have 26 mission trip opportunities, which is so exciting. So I am going to share those with you. Um, as I speak, we're going to be handing out papers that have all of the lists or all of the mission trips on them. So without any further ado, here are the 2018-2019 mission trips for Campbellsville University. Um, we are going in fall break to Tampa, Florida, Oklahoma, New York City, and Washington, D.C. In Christmas break, we're going to Dallas, Texas, and Arlington, Texas um, for the Buckner Shoes. So if you're interested in that, um, why don't you come along? Um, February, we are going to Lynch, Kentucky. Spring break, we're going to Mexico City, Belize, Eastern Kentucky, France, Australia, Florida for the men's prisons and women's prisons, Beach Haiti with My Life Speaks, and Belize with the School of Education. In the summer of 28, or 2019, we are going to have internships with Buckner International. Um, we're going to Europe, New York, Haiti, Scotland, and London, Ghana, and then Ed is offering the opportunity to go to see the crew and um, do, place, do um, things around here. So that's it. Hashtag see you on the go. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. In 1992, I was finishing up uh, graduate work in Louisville when a new freshman came to the University of Louisville named Brian Kaiser. Uh, Brian played at the University of Louisville for Coach Denny Crum for four years, uh, 1992 to 96. Had a great career. He still, I think, is the second leading all-time percentage three-point shooter for U of L. I think Brian shot about 42 or 43 uh, percent from three-point range, which is pretty pretty strong. His last year, um, one of the great highlights of Brian's career was hitting a winning shot uh, at Pauley Pavilion to beat UCLA. Hit a three-pointer, and uh, actually, Brian, I watched that earlier today. It's still up in video form. It was kind of fun to watch. 
Um, and Coach Wooden, the long-term legendary coach, uh, Coach Crum's mentor, was actually in the stands that day, which made it a little bit more special as well. Uh, his last game at University of Louisville, his career ended there. They were playing against an unknown guy named Tim Duncan, who played with Wake Forest. And uh, Duncan and Wake Forest ended, I think, Brian's career at the University of Louisville. But he went on from there. Um, coach Crum would say, I think, if he were here this morning, I've heard him say it publicly, and he said it privately as well. Brian had a tremendous influence on the guys on his team, on the many men and women that he interacted with at the University of Louisville, and Coach Crum would add on his life. Uh, Coach Crum credits Brian, and he, he credits Bob Russell at Southeast Christian Church with just a, a really strong Christian influence on, uh, on his life. Brian left U of L. He graduated in 1996, and he went to. Uh, served for 10 years with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes in Louisville, serving churches or serving schools in the South End and West End, helping to set up FCAs and working uh, with my brother Steve, who absolutely loves Brian Kaiser and his family. Uh, when Brian graduated from U of L, some of you seniors will appreciate this. The, the year he graduated, he graduated, he got a job, started a new job with FCA, and he married the love of his life, Wendy. Uh, who was a track athlete, I think, at, uh, at UofL. Uh, Wendy and Brian have eight children. Why eight? He has four boys and four girls. Why eight, not nine? Because Wendy at one point said, Brian, eight is enough. It's enough. We know that Brian is good at making baskets and making babies. We know at least these <laughs> two things about him. Um, his son, Sam, some of you know Sam. Where, Sam, where are you? Where's Sam? Right here. <laughs> Sam, stand up. Some of you know Sam Kaiser? Sam uh, was, I think, freshman of the year in the MSC last year. Great runner. Uh, Sam's a student, now sophomore, business major. And his brother, Henry, is, we think Henry may start here next year, but he's going to have to grow a little bit more. Henry's 11, Henry, am I remembering right? 11 years old? Okay. So we all welcome Henry to this morning. We're glad to have Henry with us. Brian worked uh, 10 years with FCA in Louisville, and then God was just tugging on his heart about missions. And um, he has served in some really interesting places. He's been in Sudan. He and Wendy took their family to Sudan. They have uh, had significant imprint in Egypt, in Israel, uh, most recently in Jordan. And he'll talk some about really uh, just a passion that he has in reaching Muslims for Christ. Uh, Brian is very focused on uh, parenting and helping impart parenting skills as part of his uh, missions. But would you all welcome my friend and our brother in Christ, Brian Kaiser. Is that good for lights and everything? All right, good. Okay, it's a privilege to be here with you guys. Open your holy cell phones to Matthew chapter 28, please. Matthew 28, we're going to look at a familiar passage. If you didn't bring your Bible or your holy cell phone, just pull up next to somebody who does have one. Um, Sam, I need you to come up here just for a second, okay? So today we're going to talk about missions and he has probably heard this teaching like 50 times probably, right? You've probably heard this 50 times. So I want you to tell them just like a few of the things that they're going to hear today. I'm going to see how much you can actually um, say. Matthew 28 talks about going and reaching people throughout like the nations. So I know I'm going to hear that for sure. Um, he's probably going to talk about, um, let's see, I don't know word for word everything, but he's going to talk about going overseas and all the places they've been, it's been, I mean, multiple places, the tinfoil window and over in the Middle East, so. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, that's pretty good. All right, have a seat. Have a seat. Okay, I thought he was going to talk about uh, waffles and pancakes, and, but hey, he didn't go there. All right, okay. So, uh, if I could summarize what we're going to talk about this morning, I would say that Jesus deserves to be worshipped among the unreached people groups of the world. That Jesus deserves to be worshipped among the unreached 
peoples of the world. And that's where I'd like to, to begin. Uh, I, I grew up in a small town in eastern Kentucky. I grew up in a church-going home. Uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about God or about the Bible, but my dad did probably ten times better than his father did in that he took us to church every Sunday. So from a very early age, I had heard the gospel, even in a non-evangelical church. I heard the gospel. I heard Bible stories. I got to college and really started getting involved in an evangelical church, got involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And that's when things just started to make a whole lot of sense to me as a freshman at University of Louisville, um, growing spiritually, actually reading the Bible for myself and sharing my faith with other people for the first time in my life. Uh, so it started to make a little more sense. Graduated from U of L as a student athlete. My wife, she was a student athlete there as well. Got married right out of college. Started having kids immediately. We do have eight kids now. Y'all can start clapping anytime now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Four boys, four girls. Oldest is 21. Youngest is nine. So we are very blessed. And served for almost 10 years with Fellowship of Christian Athletes in Louisville. Loved what I did. Didn't think I'd ever be doing anything else than FCA. But then September 11th happened, 2001. And I actually started looking at a map saying, where is Afghanistan? What do these people believe? What is Islam? What does Islam teach? And the Lord began to burden their hearts for unreached people groups, people who have not yet heard the gospel, to the point where we moved 2005 to Jordan. Jordan is the country between Israel and Iraq and Syria and Saudi Arabia. So it, in a way, it's an island of stability and a sea of instability. We were there for a year just studying the Arabic language and preparing to go to Sudan. So we were in Khartoum, Sudan for two years. Khartoum is hot and it's dusty and it's hot and it's poor and it's hot. And we lived there just for two years. I was teaching at a small Bible school, but spending most of my time having conversations with Arab Muslim friends. And that's probably why they rejected our resident residency visa for the third year. We weren't able to stay there. Uh, so Khartoum, Sudan was where Osama bin Laden lived before he moved to Afghanistan. So that mentality was still there. We spent a few months in Alexandria, Egypt, but then like six years back here in Kentucky. And during that time, God opened up a door for me to be able to use Facebook to engage Saudis in gospel conversations. So I was doing that for about four years, going in and out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, to visit these guys. I got a little too much attention doing that. I knew it would come at some point, uh, but they rejected that visa as well. I was not able to travel in and out. I knew it was going to happen at some point and was grateful for seven trips in and out of a very closed country. Uh, however many Muslims there are in the world, 1.5 billion Muslims in the world every day, five times a day, face Mecca in Saudi Arabia and pray to Mecca five times a day. So it's a, obviously a place where uh, fundamental uh, Islam has, has a root. But what a privilege to be able to go in there and talk about the hope that's found in the gospel and who Jesus really is. You know, if, if people ask me a lot, what's the difference between Islam and Christianity? And this is really how I engage Muslims in gospel conversation is to say, you know, I studied the Quran. And I compared it with the previous holy books that are found in the Bible. And I found that there's more similarities than there are differences. But there's one huge difference that caused me not to become a Muslim. And immediately they say, well, what's that? And I say, well, it's simply one verse in the Quran. And it says, in Arabic, it says, وَمَا كَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَّبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَا لَهُمْ which simply means they didn't kill him or crucify him. But it just looked like it was Jesus on the cross. And so if there is no crucifixion, then there is no resurrection. And there is no justification by grace through faith alone. And the gospel is not true. And so with all respect to you, my Muslim friend, I cannot believe that 
the Quran is from God because it contradicts what's already been said in the previous holy books. Muslims will say that the holy books have been corrupted or changed. And that's a whole other conversation of, in and of itself. But to have that kind of conversation with Islamic friends over the past 15 years has been a real privilege to be able to represent the, the church to go among the unreached people of the world. Look with me at Matthew 28. We're going to look at some, uh, some passages that I hope are familiar to you. Let's start at verse 18. Jesus said, go and make, I think this is verse 19. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Actually, let's, let's rewind. Verse 18. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and I will be, be with you always to the end of the age. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to whom? To Jesus. He's been given it all. He has all authority over every government and every country in this world he has all authority over each and every heart in this room he is lord of all one day every knee will bow every tongue will confess that jesus is lord and that's the truth no matter what the rest of the world says it is true jesus said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me therefore Therefore, because I own it all, therefore go and make disciples. Those are not passive words. I don't picture somebody over in a corner somewhere saying, well, I'll just sit over here and if somebody comes and asks me about Jesus, then I'll tell them about Jesus. No, I picture somebody actively engaging the culture in which they live or going cross-culturally to engage an unreached people group to give them the only hope that any of us have. And that is the cross of Christ, the gospel, that Christ died and he rose again. And to share that truth and expect God to take dead bones, dead hearts, and breathe life into them and give faith so that people can be born again. That's... That's what it means to go and make disciples. By God's grace, you can make disciples. And it says that you can make disciples of all nations. Now, when we think of the word nation, what's another word that comes to mind? What's a synonym of nation? Country, right? If you think of the nation of the United States, or you think of the nation of Saudi Arabia, or the nation of Jordan. But the word that Jesus chose here, because there's, there were those kind of geographical boundaries in the first century, the word that Jesus chose here is the word ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnicity. And rather than geographical boundaries, it means more like people group. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all people groups in the world. So what makes a people group? A people group, they have similar what? languages they have similar culture they like the same kind of foods they have a similar religion these are things that bind people together to make a people group right so what is an unreached people group and is there a difference between being unsaved and being unreached there is a difference there's a huge difference because we all know unsaved people we have them in our classes at school we work with them they're even in our homes at times people who are not yet born again even though they may or may not have heard the gospel they are unsaved but yet unreached means that they lived within a people group this is the missiological definition if you're an unreached people group you live within a people group that less than two percent of your people are, would consider themselves to be evangelical, born-again followers of Christ who believe the Bible is true. Less than 2%. Now, 
In the United States of America, that's 25%. That doesn't mean 20, a quarter of us are saved. It just means a quarter of us would identify with the evangelical Christian faith. In Kentucky, it's almost 50%. We're number two behind Tennessee in the highest percentage of evangelicals in the United States. So God has very much blessed our country with a knowledge of the truth. But there's 6,000 unreached people groups that have yet to hear the gospel yet. They represent approximately 40% of the world's population. And they live within an area of the world called the 1040 window. If you can imagine, what's that little line that cuts through the that cuts through the world called the equator? It's not really there, but you know that that little line, the equator, ten degrees north by forty degrees north, creates a window in our world today that is good job. That is the ten forty window. Northern Africa, the Middle East, and basically all of Asia. Something like ninety seven percent of the unreached people in the world live within this. 1040 window so it's a focus for mission activity right how are we going to get the gospel to the hundreds of millions of people who've yet to hear for two years before we moved back to Jordan three years ago I was part of a team that was mobilizing campus ministries across the U.S. to reach students from the country of Saudi Arabia Saudi was number two behind the Chinese five years ago for highest number of international student populations in the United States. Well, I would ask campus ministry leaders and collegiate pastors in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana, what percent of the students at your campus during their lifetime will hear the gospel in a way they can understand and have a friend who's a born-again believer? If you just had to guess, what percent would you say? during their lifetime and they would say oh probably 90 percent of students here at Tennessee Tech or Eastern Kentucky University or Southern Indiana University have will have that opportunity during their night lifetime some might have said 80 percent some said 99 all of them will have a chance to hear I asked that same question I would tell them this I asked that same question to five career missionaries in Saudi Arabia regarding the people group of Saudi Arabs Nejdi and Hejazi Arabs what percentage of those people will hear the gospel in a way they can understand and have a friend, a personal relationship with someone who's a born-again believer during their lifetime? Three of them said 1%. The other two said single digits, so less than 10% will have that chance during their lifetime. That is the tragedy of what is unreached people groups is that there are literally hundreds of millions of people who have yet to hear about the grace of God in a way that they can understand and know somebody who can even tell them. And certainly they can look online, but who can put the dots together for them and even help them even think about looking for something different than Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or atheism? Who can challenge them to think a little bit broader and be used of God to help them understand the gospel. So there's a whole lot of things being done in the name of missions, right? I can remember working with FCA. Sometimes I'd go to a church to speak or I'd go to an FCA group to speak. And they'd say, we're going to take a mission trip this summer. I was like, man, that's great. Where are you guys going? They're like, we're going to Breathitt County. I was like, Breathitt County? That's right next to where I grew up. I grew up in Estill County. Breathitt County borders Estill County. Well, why are you going to go to Breathitt County? And they said, well, we're going on a mission trip. Basically, what they meant was they were going to go up and do, you know, do some building or distribute some food or distribute some clothes. A lot of things being done in the name of missions. Do you find the word missions in the English Bible anywhere? You don't. You don't find the word missionary in the English Bible. But if you could think of somebody in the Bible who was a missionary, who do you think of? You think of Paul, right? The Apostle Paul took the gospel further than anyone had taken it. And what did Paul say? Paul says in Romans, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. 
Paul's burden was to take the gospel among the unreached people who have yet to hear. And that is, biblically, that is apostolic work, or that is missions. And so we can do things. There's nothing to keep us from doing good things for people. But, oh, who's going to take the gospel among the unreached people of the earth who have yet to hear and yet to have the, have the church founded among them to do that work among the unreached? I'll give you another way to think about it. What's that story where Jesus got angry? Do you remember that story? What happened? They, if you remember, there had been uh, something happened in the temple. The temple was for what nation of people? The Jewish people, right? The temple was for the Jewish people. And so if you live, is anybody here from Jewish descent? Anybody at all? So if you're not a Jew, then you are a Gentile, according to the Bible, right? It's not a word we use very often, but the Bible uses it a lot. So if you lived in the first century, could you just walk up into the temple? No, you could not, because you were not a Jew. But there was a place for you. It was a place off to the side, and it was called the Court of the Gentiles. And history tells us that this is where the Jewish people had set up shop buying and selling doves and animals to be used for sacrifice. This is where the court of the Gentiles was. And Jesus walked in, and he was furious. Can you all imagine nice little Jesus flipping over people's tables? But that's what was happening. You know, there's a couple times in Scripture where it says Jesus was angry, but this is the only time in Scripture where it, Jesus actually expressed anger in some way. I don't think he was out of control. I think it was very controlled, holy anger, right? But he flipped over tables, and what did he say? He said, my father's house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. He uses that exact same word, ethnos. You see, the one time in Scripture where Jesus expressed anger had something to do with God's heart for all peoples of the earth. Oswald Smith said, no one has the right to hear the gospel twice, while there remain some who have yet to hear it once. I don't have any problem with anybody hearing the gospel five times or 100 times, but his point is clear. There are hundreds of millions of people who have yet to hear the gospel even once, and we have that privilege to take it to them. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he said, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Who's he speaking to at that moment in Matthew 28? He's speaking to the twelve, right? He's speaking to the disciples. But were they going to live to the end of the age? No. Eleven of those twelve men died martyr deaths. They died for their faith. So who's he also speaking to? He's speaking through time. He's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. And he's saying, go and make disciples of all nations. I will close with one quote from Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor is a known missionary to China. He said these words, It will not do to say that you have no special call to go to China. With the facts before you and the command of the Lord Jesus to go and preach to all creation, you need rather to ascertain whether you have a special call to stay at home. I, I don't see a missionary call in Scripture. I see a call to follow Jesus. I see a call to believe the gospel. But I think when God gives us the faith to answer that call and we're born again, then we are all, as followers of Christ, called to do whatever we can do to make Jesus known and to glorify God. Whatever that is, whatever gifting you have, whatever special ability you have, whatever opportunities God gives you, Use every bit of it for his glory. And you pray, Lord, show me what is my little place in your kingdom. There's no clergy laity distinction. We are called to glorify God in whatever we do and to make him known as much as we can make him known. And just remember that I close with Jesus deserves to be worshiped 
among unreached people groups in the world. He is worthy. With his blood, he purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of the gospel that even if you told us even, Jesus, that broad is the road that leads to destruction, many will find it. Narrow is the road that leads to eternal life and only a few find it. We thank you that the gospel is true even if only a few find it. Father, we believe that there are a few called out ones, a church, in many unreached people groups today. And you promise that that's actually going to happen before the end comes, that the gospel will be preached all over the earth. Father, I pray you would burden hearts in this room to use whatever abilities and capabilities that they have to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, whether that's they themselves go or they send or they pray or all of the above. And we thank you for the ways through the internet that we can engage people in faith conversation as well. Let this place be a place where workers are sent into your harvest field, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.